Okay. Um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you to Gladstone Institute's QBI um, Joint Organized Infectious Disease and Human Health Series Seminar um, today um, with Ellen Foxman. Um, I want to tell you all, well, first of all, a very happy welcome. And then um, this is a webinar, so um, unfortunately, we don't get to see all of your faces. Um, and you're muted um, up on entering the room. Um, you'll be able to ask questions for Dr. Foxman's talk, though, in the question and answer box at the bottom right of your screen. Um, feel free to answer your questions there. And um, uh, at the end of her talk, um, I will call on you individually and unmute you so that you can ask your questions in person. Um, if you would prefer for me to read the questions instead, that's totally fine too. You can indicate that and then I'll just um, read the question um, to Dr. Foxman that works too. Um, so much just for the logistics. We're already, we have a really full room already of people. People are very excited. Uh, and I'm very excited to have you here, Dr. Foxman. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Um, and I wanted to give a little bit of um, a, a background um, of um, Dr. Foxman's training and uh, research. So she trained as an MD PhD at Stanford um, and then went back to the East Coast for her residency in clinical pathology at um, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I thought that I would mess this up. I read this all the time and I can never say it straight. But anyway, she went back to Boston um, and uh, then returned to her undergrad alma mater at Yale, um, where she worked as a postdoc with um, Akiko Iwasaki. Um, and she studied um, host virus interactions there. Um, I thought the postdoc work that you did was really cool, um, where you showed that cold air actually has something to do with us getting a cold. Um, um, because it contributes to dim diminished antiviral responses in the airway epithelia. I keep on thinking about that every time I'm, I'm in the cold air here, even though in California it doesn't even get so cold. Um, so yeah, really cool. And then um, she started her own lab at Yale in 2016 and continues uh, studying respiratory viruses um, and cellular antiviral responses um, in the airway epithelia. Um, and um, I guess um, her residency training in clinical pathology um, uh, contributed to having part of the lab still focused on diagnostics, um, um, where uh, she's looking at uh, or exploring ways to use biomarkers of the body's responses to infection to diagnose the cause of respiratory symptoms. Um, I'm very excited, uh, as I have said several times now, that you're um, joining us today. Um, and I heard um, when we um, checked in earlier that today she's going to be speaking about um, recent work um, of interference between rhinovirus infection and influenza A infection, um, and linking it also maybe a little bit uh, to SARS-CoV-2 and the current pandemic. So I'm excited to hear about that. Um, and just to remind everybody who joined a few minutes um, later, this is a webinar, so you can't ask questions throughout the talk, but feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. I will call on participants after the talk and then unmute you so that you can ask Dr. Foxman uh, your questions directly. Um, so again, thank you very much for being here, um, Ellen, and uh, take it away with your talk. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here at the Glad, well, virtually here at the Gladstone Institute of Virology, a leader in virology research. So it's an honor to be asked to present. And I wish I could have come there in person. I actually did, a, you know, I did a fair chunk of my training out on the West Coast and I really miss it, especially days like today where it's actually snowing out my window here in Connecticut today, believe it or not. So, um, but you know, the pandemic will end and, and we'll be able to travel again. But in the meantime, it's really great to be able to zoom over uh, to UCSF and be with all of you virtually. Uh, and so let me know, so you'll let me know, Manon, if, the, if you can't see my slides advancing, because yes. uh, hopefully, I, we checked it before, it should all be good. Uh, but you can see the slide, correct? Yes, okay. let me see the slide. All right, good, just, just making sure. 
Yes. So uh, today I'd like to talk about um, one of my favorite topics, which is host defense against respiratory viruses. And mostly I'm going to talk about the tissue that you see depicted on this, on this cover slide here, which is the human respiratory epithelium. And this is actually a nasal mucosal um, tissue from surgery at Yale. And you can see the nasal mucosal epithelium here with uh, several cell layers thick of airway epithelial cells. And you also see the cilia, which are the, the little hairs that, that you see projecting from some of the cells. And the magenta stain is showing you the mucus that's being produced by these cells. Uh, and the reason that we are interested in focusing on these cells in the lab is uh, they're, they're sort of an interesting and relatively unexplored territory for understanding defense against respiratory viruses. Uh, and they're important in two ways. One is these are the main target cells in which, in which uh, respiratory viruses productively replicate and make more virions. So they're in a very important as the host cell. And also they're the first line of defense, uh, both by things that they secrete to create a barrier but then even when the virus gets into the cells, the innate immune responses that these cells have right at the beginning of infection can actually completely suppress viral replication and keep the virus from growing. So nip the infection in the bud. So, so um, a lot of what we are studying, like for example, now you see a lot of papers about SARS-CoV-2 of things that are happening in moderate and severe illness there the horse has left the barn and the virus has replicated and now traveled throughout the body and we're looking at things that distinguish uh you know how the infection proceeds from there but when you're talking about the airway epithelium you're really talking about whether some an infection takes hold in the first place and begins and that that's probably more differentiating those people who have an asymptomatic detection or a very mild illness from people who progress so so there's a lot of untapped potential here um, and, uh, and that's why this is a very interesting sort of part of the anatomy that we're studying as a, to find complementary methods of antiviral defense in addition to those mediated by cells of the immune system. So today I'm gonna to talk about um, a couple different topics. Uh, I'd like to sort of give you all a background of, uh, that's really closely related to how I got interested in this field to begin with. I actually did my PhD in immunology, nothing to do with viruses, and became interested in respiratory viruses during my residency training in clinical pathology because the landscape was shifting in how we detected these viruses, and it raised a lot of interesting questions. So I kind of want to tell you that story and talk about host interactions with common respiratory viruses. And then I'm going to talk about a recent story that my lab has been working on on um, a different pandemic, not this pandemic, but the 2009 swine flu pandemic and the intersection between that pandemic virus and uh, common virus, human rhinovirus. So um, what I've depicted here, when I say common respiratory viruses, mostly I'm going to be talking about human rhinovirus, which is a small uh, RNA virus in the coronavirus family. And this virus is responsible for uh, half of all common colds, the majority of childhood asthma attacks and exacerbations of chronic lung disease. And in fact, any population you go into and swab the nose, whether that be people out in the community or people in the hospital or people with colds, this is the most common virus that you're gonna find. And so it's, it's a really, in, it's difficult to study because it doesn't, there's no animal model, for example, but so it's difficult in a way, but it's very high impact in humans and it's very, uh, relatively understudied for its impact. So, so we, normally I start my talk, before this year I always start my talks with a few slides explaining that respiratory viruses are important and high impact. But this year that's not necessary. I think that everyone's, everyone's on board with that idea since we're all meeting here by Zoom instead of in person because of a respiratory virus. And the, pen, the potential for emergence of pandemic viruses is certainly a really important reason to stay on top of this field. Um, but in addition, just the regular respiratory viruses that we get in seasonal epidemics every year after year are also high impact in terms of human health. Uh, here are just some statistics. <clears throat> it's estimated that in the US alone, there's over 500 million respiratory virus illnesses every year. And uh, that's more than one per person if you do the math. And uh, about 2 million of those lead to hospitalizations in a normal year. Uh, 
And of the 500 million, uh, a lot of those are relatively mild. We're talking about common cold, sore throat, sinusitis, ear infections, and so forth. Um, but uh, but uh, but uh, you can't tell from the symptoms that somebody has which exact virus it is that's causing the infection. So I've listed here some of the main classes of respiratory viruses. There's about 10 to 15, depending on how you count. I think on our Yale New Haven respiratory panel, we test for 15 viruses. Uh, but the major categories are listed here, rhinovirus, influenza, RSV, coronaviruses, and so forth. Um, but if you look at all the respiratory virus infections, as I mentioned, about half of them are caused by rhinovirus and about half of them are caused by the other, all the other viruses put together. And so virus, respiratory viruses were first really grown in culture in the 1950s and 60s. And for several decades, the way that they were evaluated in patient samples is some variation of what's shown in this picture here. This is actually a respiratory viral culture. And what was done is these, all, these roller drums are filled with tubes that each contain cell lines. And the patient sample was inoculated into the cell line. And then a tech would actually take that tube out of the incubator and look it in the microscope every day to see whether viral cytopathic effect or killing of the cells characteristic of viral infection and was developing. And uh, that is that was viral culture. And then a few other techniques came into it, such as which involving Im immunofluorescence and serology. But as you can imagine, viral culture is not a very sensitive method for detecting a virus in clinical samples. Many viruses won't grow, or they don't grow in those cell lines, or they don't uh, grow under those conditions, or they don't produce cytopathic effect that's visible. So he, often it was the case when this technique was used that even somebody who's clearly sick with an acute respiratory viral infection, you're not gonna detect the virus. And in fact, often the test wasn't done. Um, but what really changed is the, is the introduction of increasingly improved genomic methods for looking for the viral genomes in clinical samples. And, you know, PCR was invented in the 1980s, and then what happened was like each decade it kind of moved along in terms of clinical application. First being a research tool, then being a clinical diagnostic tool, and then becoming an epidemiological tool. And at each stage, uh, that that really kind of changed things and changed our view of things. And uh, we all know now, now there's even better improvements in, in genomic methods due to, um, you know, a lot of the technological development even just this year. But basically what happens is when you switch from a very insensitive method to suddenly having an extremely sensitive and specific method, you see new things and it raises new questions. And I'll just give you an example of where we were and where we are. So, uh, I mentioned these viruses are first grown in culture in the 1950s and 60s. And then in the 1960s, there were several big studies in the US to try to understand the prevalence of these viruses and which ones are the most important and so forth. And a famous one is the Tecumseh, Michigan study from 1965 to 1969. And this was a study of symptomatic patients uh, where they looked to try to figure out which virus was causing the illness. And of all the, using all the state-of-the-art methods at the time, they were only able to find a virus in 25% of the people. And if they looked at all the samples combined just for rhinovirus, it represented 10%. Uh, fast forward to 1998, and using a PCR panel and some of these other techniques, and not even nearly the kind of PCR panel that, or genomic panel that we would use today, the same thing if they took symptomatic patients, they now can find a virus in 69% of the people and half the, half the symptomatic people had rhinovirus. So that's, that's just um, an example of, and this is not even a very big study, the Finland study or a big high budget study like the Tecumseh, Michigan study. So, it, so I hope this illustrates the point of how the technology has made it so much easier to see these, these um, infections. But what really caught my interest when I was a resident and these PCR panels became applied to patient samples was not so much the diagnostic, the finding of a virus in a symptomatic subject, but actually the high frequency of viral detections out there in the community in asymptomatic people. And I'll just give you some examples here. So uh, another one of the big the classic studies in the 1960s was the Seattle Virus Watch. 
And this wasn't a study of symptomatic people. This was a community-based family study where family members were just, respiratory samples were just taken on a regular basis. And I think in addition, they took samples of people develop symptoms. And out of those samples, they found a vi rhinovirus was the most common virus and it was detected in 2.3% of the samples. And they calculated, this is a figure from the paper, they calculated an incidence of rhinovirus infections as, as you can see here, less than one per year. Uh, if we fast forward to uh, the Utah Big Love study, which was a similar type of community study, but this was, um, this was published in 2015 and done in 2010, um, where uh, family members were also, a, a nasal swab was taken every week for a year, which is really quite heroic, and resulting in over 4,000 samples. And if you looked at the virus detection in those samples, of all the person weeks, 26% of the person weeks were virus positive. And then if you only look for rhinovirus and none of the other viruses, and they looked at like 20 different virus, viruses in the study, rhinovirus alone represented was 17% of the person weeks were positive for rhinovirus. And what's even more striking is if you looked at just the young children, which had the highest rates, half the person weeks were positive for a virus. So 26 out of 52 weeks a year, these kids were virus positive. And, and if you only looked at rhinovirus and nothing else, 34% of the person weeks were, were rhinovirus positive. So, um, and, then, and then one additional thing that makes it even more interesting is that a lot of these detections were asymptomatic, about half. So, and I think for rhinovirus, it might've been in the 60%, somewhere around there for asymptomatic. So, so I hope this illustrates to you this, there's a really big difference. It's not just a more convenient test, it's a test that actually calls into question what we know about the sort of relationship between a pathogen and a disease when it comes to viral respiratory infection. And, um, and, and, and uh, it's an example, especially for the trainees, of how, like you could see how the change in technology then leads to these questions. And when I was a resident and we were getting all these virus positive test results, what do they mean? You know, so that, so from a diagnostic question, and then from, from a background as an immunologist, the question is, well, that's pretty interesting that there are all these viral infections going on at the time that we're not aware of. What could they be doing? You know, what could they be doing biologically in the body? And, uh, and an example, it's not a perfect analogy, but an example is the Human Microbiome Project that I'm sure everybody's somewhat familiar with. The idea that there's microbes on our skin and our gut and our mouth and so on and that there's different microbial compositions in communities and different people that are interacting with our mucosal surfaces. And what's going on in those interactions, even though they're not causing symptoms, can change the immunological response to, a, let's say, if you become exposed to a pathogen. And even can change the immunological response in other settings, like in the setting of cancer or in the setting of autoimmunity. So, so there is sort of a, an idea that there's these, these um, pathogens that are in our, or microbes that are interacting with our body below the radar of symptoms are still influencing our, our immune system and our basal health. So is, is there an analogous thing going on in the respiratory tract with these frequent viral infections? Well, there's some things that are different and some things that are similar in, in this analogy. I mean, one of the most important differences is that the frequent viral infections that I, that I mentioned from that uh, Big Love study and from other similar studies are not the same as colonization of the respiratory tract with the virus. If you actually look, you see a different virus every week, or even if you see rhinovirus week after week, if you genotype it, it's a different rhinovirus. So it paints the picture that these RNA viruses are just part of the environment that we become frequently exposed to, but they aren't colonizing us. Um, but a similarity could be that if these if host virus interactions are occurring, that that could be altering our immune responses, particularly the set point of innate immunity, and it may even affect systemic immunity. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit of evidence for that, of host interactions with these common viral infections. <laughs> 
So this is just to introduce the idea that epithelial cells are immunologically active because I know that a lot of us, when we think of the immune system, we think of leukocytes, we think of lymphocytes, we think of macrophages as being the cells that detect pathogens and respond by killing the pathogens and secreting cytokines and so on. But actually epithelial cells that form our mucosal barriers are also quite active in this regard. And this is sort of what I'm gonna describe in this little cartoon is the classic antiviral defense of the interferon response. And in this response, the virus enters a cell. It's detected by any immune sensors. In the case of an RNA virus, it's usually the cytoplasmic sensors, MDA5 or RIG-I, which leads to secretion of type one and type three interferons, which then bind to receptors on neighboring cells and create uh, antiviral state by inducing gene, antiviral genes in all of the nearby cells. And this is just a more detailed picture with the actual molecules involved. That's a really nice uh, figure from a review from 2011. And you can see again the viral RNA interacting with the rig eye like receptors, turning on transcription factors that turn on expression of interferons as well as interferon stimulated genes, which are, and then, and then once the interferon signaling happens, you get a positive feedback loop. So, and these, um, these interferon stimulated genes are a very diverse family of like 300 or more different molecules in different classes, which all have different functions in blocking viral replication. And this is just to, to convince you further, I guess, that these cells are very active in this regard. This is a very simple experiment in which we transfected primary human nasal epithelial cells with a small molecule ligand of the rig eye like receptor made by uh, Anna Pyle's lab at Yale. And if you just wait a few hours, you can see robust induction of lots of genes, uh, interferon stimulated genes, as shown here. And you can also see induction of, um, you know, a huge induction of the RNA for interferons and other biologically active uh, molecules. And you can even see secretion of the proteins by these cells. I think this, this, show, this figure shows about 500 picogram per mil by eight hours, and you have over two nanograms per mil by 24 hours. So it's really pumping out a lot of these molecules. And uh, then we became interested to see if these are detected these same responses are detectable in vivo. And this was a small project done in collaboration with Marie Landry, the director of our clinical virology lab at Yale, where we use the nasopharyngeal swab. I used to have to explain what that is, but I don't think I have to this year. It's the swab that goes, you know, goes way back in the nose and that's what we use to detect viral infections. Um, but we, in this study, we didn't look just at the viruses, we also looked at RNAs and proteins involved in the host response to infection. And this is kind of a busy figure from, from that paper, but uh, I'll focus you on the panel A here with these three colored graphs showing CXCL10, IFIT2, and OASL. So th those graphs show the RNA level of each of those genes, which are interferon stimulated genes, on a log scale. And the, the vertical line represents the amount that that same gene is turned on by the rig eye ligand in the in vitro experiment. And I, I hope you can, and these horizontal red and black lines indicate whether a virus was detected in that sample. And so what I hope you can appreciate is that these RNAs are very, considering this is a log scale, they're very much more highly induced in samples that contain a virus than samples that are virus negative. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the details on this figure, but uh, this, this pie chart here shows all of the viruses that were present in the sample set for the first study. And then we did a second study with a different composition of viruses. And basically, these ISGs were up in all, of our, all the respiratory virus infections, regardless of which virus it was. And in fact, we used a sort of a scoring system. If two out of three of these mRNAs were above the threshold, we, call, we said we predict this as virus positive. And that was accurate predicting the presence of a respiratory virus uh, with an accuracy of 97%. So it was, it was a very robust signal. And also it was a pretty uniform signal regardless of, of which virus it is. And what, so these, these were all people who were being evaluated in the hospital for whatever reason. They may, may or may not have had typical acute respiratory symptoms. Uh, but they were patients. 
But what's really interesting is a few people have actually gone and done some similar type of analysis of what's going on in the nasopharynx in asymptomatic subjects. And um, I, there's not two, this is not a very uh, well-established uh, observation. There's just a few small studies. Uh, but this one was that I'm showing you here was nasal cytokines in asymptomatic infants based on the nasopharyngeal aspirate. And, and they're looking at um, pre-coronavirus positive and negative. So basically rhinovirus positive and negative. And what they could see is a lot of very potent innate immune cytokines were highly expressed in the nasopharynx of these babies when they had a pre-coronavirus compared to when they didn't, even though they, all these children were asymptomatic. And then a similar, there was a similar paper showing for children less than two years of age on looking at RNA um, sort of ratios of, of um, ISG RNAs and showing the same thing. So, so just to summarize what I've told you so far, um, a really intriguing and, and still not totally explored phenomenon is this idea that uh, now that we are able to not only use these viral panels to diagnose patients, but epidemiologists have actually looked in the population, we know that there's a very high rate of interactions of RNA respiratory viruses with our upper respiratory tract. Um, and that you can detect host virus interactions going on even in the absence of symptoms. Uh, so so um, that sort of lays the groundwork for the uh, story that I'd like to uh, go delve into further detail on, um, which, was, which is about a pandemic, not this pandemic, but a previous pandemic in 2009. So as, as many of you may recall, um, in 2009, there was an emerging influenza A virus. And these influenza A viruses, you know, these, the influenza pandemics, there's a bunch of famous ones. Uh, you know, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic is probably the most famous. Um, but the most recent one was in 2009. And these, these pandemics basically result from the influenza virus, which you can see here with its segmented viral genome can mix and match, you know, and, and usually those mixes and matches don't result in a, in a novel virus that can infect a new host, but sometimes they do. And that's what, that's what happened in 2009, uh, starting in North America in April of 2009. Actually, the first case was a 10-year-old in California diagnosed on April 15th, 2009, that had this recombinant, a, a new variant of the H1N1 influenza virus that was called the swine flu because it came from a, a flu that most recently was circulating in North American swine. And then by June of 2009, the WHO had declared a pandemic because this virus was really spreading around. And this virus was expected to go to Europe and start causing a pandemic there in the late summer of 2009. And what was really interesting is, is the pattern that people saw in several European countries, which, was, which is shown here. So basically, uh, the virus, the influenza A virus began to be detected in, in August 2009 in several countries. It's not, not shown in the graph here. But then school started, and when school starts, that's when the seasonal rhinovirus epidemic occurs. So rhinovirus is year-round, but the most prevalent peak is in the fall, starting about two weeks after school entry through like November. And so when school started, uh, everyone coming in with acute uh, respiratory illness had rhinovirus infection. And actually very few cases of influenza A, the emerging influenza were detected until rhinovirus began to go away. And that's when the pandemic took off. So it created a lot of speculation at the time that rhinoviruses delayed the circulation. I mean, there's many other explanations, but this pattern uh, was seen in several countries and led to a lot of hypothesis papers, some of which I've uh, cited here. And, and the idea of viral interference has been around a long time. So the, the, the idea was, is uh, defined here by Isaacs and Burke in 1959, which is that the action of a virus, whether it be live or inactivated, on cells or a tissue or an individual, uh, makes those cells or tissue or individual refractory to infection by another virus for a period of time. And that other virus could be a related virus or an unrelated virus. 
And there are reports of this as early as the, the 1800s with Edward Jenner, who was doing the vaccinia uh, inoculations for, you know, to protect against smallpox. And he reported that uh, if someone had herpes lesions, they didn't develop the good vaccinia lesion that, 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 that you would expect. And then there are numerous examples reported in the 1930s of, of dual infections of animals where this phenomenon was observed. And then when viral culture began, became a thing in the 1950s, this was also observed. And in fact, what I've shown here is a figure from the classic paper by Isaacs and Lindemann from 1957, where they, uh, they so at that time, actually to this day, influenza viruses were grown in sort of the embryonic membranes of, a, of an egg, of a chicken egg. And they found that if you expose the chicken egg to influenza, you could not then come back and infect it with influenza. And even if you used inactivated influenza, that would uh, cause this refractory period where you could not infect with another influenza virus. And they ultimately traced this to a, something the egg membranes were secreting and called it interferon. And that's where, and now we know that's type one interferon. So that's where the term interferon came from, from viral interference. So they're intimately linked, those terms. But, but as, as um, many of the, there's some great review articles about this phenomenon I've list, listed here. And of course, this is not the only possible mechanism of viral interference. There's many possible mechanisms, but this is one of them. And so we, so my lab, a couple, well, gosh, I guess I, I'm trying to think when we started this project, but maybe a year or two ago, we started looking, seeing if we could look into this further with our current data and our current models in the lab to see, is there anything to this idea of interference between rhinovirus and influenza A virus? And actually, a lot of the clinical data analysis was done by An Chi Wu, an MD, PhD student depicted here. Uh, with experiments done by Valia Mihalova and a lot of help from Marie Landry in the clinical lab. And I'll also mention that we, around this time, Yale had started this thing called the JDAT or Joint Data Analytics Team, where they hired computer programmers to allow us to extract certain types of data from the electronic medical record, which has been like an, a really big help and a very, it actually made this this project possible by allowing us to analyze tons of clinical results um, in a relatively straightforward fashion. But it was also helped by the fact that Anne, she's a pretty good programmer. Uh, but anyway, so th this is sort of the, um, the big picture of, of what went on between 2016 and 2019 in our healthcare system. And actually this is something that is seen, this is not unique to us. This is the pattern of rhinovirus and influenza A that's seen in temperate climates. And the blue shows rhinovirus detections. So basically, rhinovirus occurs mainly in the fall and again in the spring every year. As you can see, that's 2016, 2017, and then you have 2018. And then the influenza uh, pandemic generally comes in a much narrower peak, peaking in about a two week period, sometime between November and March uh, every year. And it's, it's intriguing the way that it appears that the influenza virus peak always occurs in the valley between the rhinovirus, the two rhinovirus peaks. But again, there's a lot of possible explanations for this. Uh, so the first thing that we looked at was um, we, we actually do a lot, of, a lot of respiratory virus testing at Yelman Haven. And a lot of it's rapid flu and various different methods for people who clearly have acute respiratory symptoms. But for more ambiguous uh, cases, we do a respiratory virus panel. Uh, um, you know, for, for a number of reasons. And we actually had quite a few results from this respiratory virus panel, which we analyzed to ask a simple question, uh, which was if we narrow our, our study period down to the time when rhinovirus and influenza A are co-circulating at the same time, and we have about the same number of detections, uh, how many of the time do you detect rhinovirus and influenza in the same patient compared to what you would just statistically expect to get by chance? And uh, the bottom line of that analysis is that you get, it's extremely rare to find both viruses in the same, the same sample, much, much more rare than what you'd expect by chance. And it sort of makes sense with what I told you about the seasonality. This is just zooming in on the seasonality of these two viruses, which are the blue is rhinovirus and the red is influenza. And you can see uh, influenza is coming as rhinovirus is going away. So it's not that surprising they, that there would be um, 
lower than expected detection in the same sample. And the fact that we find this lower detection doesn't tell us the cause because it could be an interaction amongst the viruses or it could be some other features of seasonality that just happen to segregate these viruses in time. Uh, so, so we wanted to test it experimentally. Um, and mice are not a good model, unfortunately, because even though I'm actually quite a good model for influenza infection, they're not a good model for a rhinovirus infection. And I myself tried very hard to make a mouse model of rhinovirus infection um, for a couple years during my postdoc. And, and uh, you can get rhinovirus to cause an immune response in mice, but you can't get the virus to replicate. Uh, so with that caveat, there was a study in 2018 in which investigators exposed mice to rhinovirus and then came in with influenza and showed that the influenza was less severe. But as I said, there, it's a limited interpretation because it's, this is not a replicating pathogen in mice. Uh, the problem with doing this experiment in cell culture is that uh, human airway epithelium are in conventional culture are very susceptible to both viruses, but they're gone after two or three days. They're all killed by the viruses, so you can't do this kind of staged infection. Um, but what we have switched to uh, for a lot of experiments in the lab is the air liquid interface culture system, which I know some folks here are using as well. And in, in this system, uh, just for those of you who aren't familiar, the, the cells grow on a filter. You grow primary human airway uh, stem cells from the, from the airway of, of donors. And then you allow them to differentiate on top of the filter simply by removing the liquid. And that air provides the signal that they need to differentiate into cells with feeding cilia and mucus production and all the features you would see in vivo. And the really cool thing is if you infect these cultures with a the virus, they will become infected and support replication. And eventually the virus goes away. And some cells do die, but the tissue as a whole repairs rather than dying. So you actually are able to do these types of stage infections. And so we simply uh, use this system to set up some experimental infections with rhinovirus and influenza. And we started out with a GFP reporter virus uh, from the Garcia Sastre lab, uh, which was a generous gift from them. And uh, what you can see is basically shown in this picture where if you infect with influenza alone and then you look the next day, you see a lot of GFP positive cells that are now infected with flu. But if you've previously infected with rhinovirus three days before and then you try to infect with flu, it's very hard to find any green cells the next day. And that's quantitated on these graphs here. So of course we know rhinovirus is a good interferon response inducer as I described before. So we, our hypothesis was that that was what was going on, that rhinovirus might be inducing interference simulated genes that then block the influenza infection. And so we did some growth curves just to look at, look at the kinetics of what was going on. And you see that both this, now we've switched from the GFP virus to the 2009 pandemic strain of influenza. And you see robust, huge robust replication of both viruses in these cultures. Uh, mostly in the first 24 hours. And you also see robust upregulation of interference stimulated genes. And this figure just shows three interference stimulated genes that we chose because these are known to limit influenza replication. And you can see that both viruses induce these, these transcripts, but the rhinovirus does it a little bit faster and more robustly than the influenza infection. Uh, so we then asked, well, does rhinovirus if you look at these early, like this early time point, like 24 hours past influenza infection, even though there are all this viral replication has occurred, there's essentially no host response yet at that time point in the influenza infection alone. But what if you have pre-infected with rhinovirus? Well, you can clearly see that in the rhinovirus pre-infected cells, you have much higher ISG expression at that. Day four of the experiment is actually 24 hours post influenza. And then if you look at viral replication, you see something very similar to what we saw with the GFP virus, where uh, you've got a lot less replication. If, if you've done this and pre-infected with influenza and you have your ISG induction, you also have less viral replication of influenza. Uh, but then we wanted to actually formally block the interferon response so that we could actually ask the, formally ask, is this really, is this not a, correl is this a correlation or is this actually the cause of the interference? And we used a drug called BX795, which is a signaling inhibitor. 
Um, and this is just some figures from a paper describing it showing that uh, this drug blocks the phosphorylation and uh, translocation of a signaling molecule called IRF3. That is a signaling molecule that's, that's downstream of the viral RNA sensors that we were talking about, MBA5 and RIG-I, that sense the viral RNA. Then they activate IRF3, which goes to the nucleus and turns on interferon and interferon-stimulated genes. So you could see, so poly-IC is a viral RNA mimic, and you can just see in this figure here, that uh, under normal circumstances, if you add poly-IC, you've got IRF3 in the nucleus, but then this drug blocks it. So, so we use this drug, and, and uh, so this, this figure just shows interferon induction in response to rhinovirus infection and then in the presence of the drug, and I think this is a pretty convincing that the drug blocked ISG induction in this situation. And then we do this sequential infection, and actually, uh, for the rhinovirus co-infection, the, having the drug present didn't, didn't make a huge difference because there was a lot of variability, but it did have a trend towards increasing rhinovirus replication. But what was, what was really dramatic is if you looked at the interference experiments. So I'll just go through each of the bars one by one. So basically, if you, this is just the influenza alone. This is how much replication you had by day five, which was 48 hours post-influenza. And then if, if you add the drug, it actually doesn't make a difference, uh, which in, in influenza infection alone, um, signifying that the, the ISG response to influenza at that time point isn't really limiting viral replication. In contrast, if you pre-infect with rhinovirus, um, you have a huge dec decrease, like I've been showing you this whole time, in the amount of viral replication that you see for influenza, about 50,000 fold decrease in viral RNA. But if you add the drug before the rhinovirus infection and prevent that ISG induction, you now rescue the viral replication. So that now you have rhinovirus, then you have influenza, and the influenza can grow just fine. So it, this formally proves that it's the, um, that, it, that it was the, that interferon response that was responsible for the inhibition of the second infection. And then finally, like more recently, we've been getting more interested in like ha the details of how this was working on a single cell level. Uh, in terms of, we know that at, at day five past the rhinovirus infection or day six, that that level of rhinovirus is really starting to go down. Um, so are there still infected cells? Are the flu and the rhinovirus infecting the same cells or different cells and what, what's, what's going on there? So this is just a, an experiment showing that this, sort of rainbow plot made by Bao Wang in my lab is showing the different cell types present in our airway epithelial cultures. And then the red dots and the orange dots in this figure show the number of cells that contain viral reads at this time point, which is five days post inoculation, which you can see is very few cells. So it's 70 cells out of 4,200. Um, but if we look at the ISG induction, so the top here is mock and the bottom is rhinovirus infected, you can see that even though you have very few cells in which you can detect viral RNA, and basically in all cells you can detect ISG induction relative to MOC. So it signifies that there's a pretty big, there's a big bystander response in all the other cells in the culture, even the ones that aren't infected. Uh, so it, you don't, this interference, you don't have to invoke the idea that, that flu and rhinovirus are infecting the same cell but rather, you know, it's the, bystand the rhinovirus infection of just a few cells is leading to this big bystander response. So just to summarize this part, um, when we looked at rhinovirus and influenza A interference, uh, the clinical data support the idea of interference, but they don't prove anything. They basically, our data, which was a pretty large study of 13,000 samples from adults, recapitulated things people have seen in other studies, mostly on children and mostly smaller than this, but a few big ones, uh, which is that there's this staggered seasonality and much lower than expected odds of detecting both viruses in the same sample. Um, but for the experimental thing is, is what this study added by using, using the differentiated culture in which sequential infection was possible showing that prior rhinovirus infection blocks subsequent influenza A, that it enhanced ISG expression early in influenza A infection when it hadn't quite gotten there yet from the influenza alone, and that blocking 
blocking IRF3, the key transcription factor for that innate immune signaling event, rescued the influenza replication following rhinovirus infection. So this evidence, again, this, I, I, you realize to change a dogma and really prove that something's happening out there in the community is difficult and requires many lines of evidence from different sources. But, I, but this evidence, experimental evidence in particular that we provide sort of adds to the growing um, building up of evidence that the back to school rhinovirus could have impacted the 2009 pattern of the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. And moreover, kind of raises the question of the degree to which these kind of interactions are leading to some of the uh, very reproducible but not completely understood patterns of seasonal respiratory virus epidemics that we see every year. Uh, so um, I kind of went over these implications already, but basically the idea is the fact that one respiratory virus can block infection with another, at least in these experimental models, uh, sort of recalibrates or thinking about rhinovirus infection. I think a lot of people would like to completely get rid of the common cold if, if, if they could, and that's definitely something that's been a, a joke and also a serious pursuit of the research community for a long time. But it suggests that in addition to causing colds and, and um, occasionally causing more severe illness, rhinovirus may also be playing another role of calibrating the innate immune set point in the airway mucosa. And it, in a way could actually have a beneficial function of protecting us from other potentially more pathogenic viruses. Um, that may not be rhinovirus's intention, but if you think about it from an ecological perspective, perhaps it's a way of the virus preserving the niche for itself. Uh, that, that could be another way of looking at it. So again, a lot of these questions need to be further explored uh, to be fleshed out and to figure out if these things are really happening out there out there in the real world. Um, and, and I look forward to participating in that and hopefully more of the community will also be participating in it. Um, and then I just wanted to bring in some implications for our current pandemic and for respiratory viruses in general. Um, so we, I don't know how many of you have seen this pyramid, but this was a really nice figure often shown early in the pandemic. Uh, this was actually a figure produced by Imperial College in their 20, uh, their, their February 10th report about, about COVID. Actually, they were calling it NCOV at the time. Uh, and it represents the idea that the deaths and severe cases that were being seen were the tip of the pyramid or the tip of the iceberg. And that, and that much, very likely there were mild symptoms or asymptomatic infections that were a much larger base of that pyramid or iceberg going on out there in the community. And in fact, we have a lot more evidence that that indeed is the case now. And, um, and this is, these are some of the statistics from China, just showing the slice of the pie that's thought to lead to severe versus moderate versus mild or asymptomatic COVID-19. And, uh, and what's interesting is this seems, this is definitely in everyone's consciousness now that we're thinking all the time about COVID-19. But if you've studied respiratory viruses, this is, the, this is the rule, not the exception for respiratory viruses. This, is, this kind of spectrum of outcomes is not true of some viruses. I mean, I, I probably shouldn't say, but I'm old enough that when I was a med student, um, there were patients, there was not a highly active antiretroviral therapy for, for HIV at that time. And, and there were a lot of people who, developed uh, you know AIDS and and severe progressive HIV and it was pretty much inevitable for most people without the the great interventions that we have now um, and so that's an example of, of a virus that uh, I've been not an expert and I feel like I am talking to a bunch of experts but in my mind it's an example of a virus that has a pretty common clinical outcome for for most people if, without proper intervention Respiratory viruses are so different in that the same exact virus we know from even experimental infection studies can be completely asymptomatic in one host and cause moderate or severe respiratory distress in someone else. And this points a big arrow at the host and host variability at being the determinant of, of where we're gonna be on that spectrum. And obviously, if we, can, if we can dial back this wheel even one notch to turn severe into moderate or moderate into mild or asymptomatic, that's a huge intervention. And that's something that we need to further explore, like what are all those host factors that could be going on there? 
And uh, so one thing based on the, the story that I told you today, I mean, there are many possible host factors that are probably important. But, but the interferon responses seems to be so potent against many of these RNA viruses. And that's, that's something that we're very interested in pursuing is what are the biological variables? We talked today about other respiratory viruses, but there are probably a whole host of, of other variables that determine the set point and kinetics of the interferon response in the airway epithelium, which may vary from one individual to another, or even within the same individual at different moments in time, depending on what you've been breathing recently. And, uh, and we'd like to get into people and see what's going on with this set point and can you predict susceptibility to viral infection that way. And um, I will not go, I'm just gonna show you this summary slide because I, I wanna leave time for questions. But the other areas of my lab, actually even before this pandemic, have been looking at the upper respiratory tract as sort of an ecological niche. And all the things depicted on the slide are things that enter that niche that might change the set point of innate immunity, such as we talked today a lot about viruses, a uh, previous viral infection, but there's a bacterial microbiome in the nasopharynx. There's different things different people breathe in because of their indoor or outdoor air quality. Um, and then there's different immune subsets that are infiltrating the nasal mucosa in some people and not others. And all of these things are potential modifiable risk factors that could impact that initial susceptibility that determines, it's sort of like the gatekeeper about whether the infection will proceed. All right, so I'm gonna skip through that. I had a couple examples, but I'm gonna skip through those for the time being unless they come up in the question and answer. And I just wanna quickly acknowledge some of the folks who contributed to this work, all of it was collaborative. Uh, I mentioned the folks in my lab who participated in the um, influenza A interference study, um, but all, all lab members contributed. We also had colleagues in pulmonary medicine, in um, Yale New Haven Hospital, immunobiology, chemistry, and statistics that, that contributed to the data that I showed. And I also wanna thank the funding. So, with that, I will stop and I will be happy to take any questions. So thank you so much for your attention. Thanks very much. This was a great talk, um, very interesting. And there are a bunch of questions already in the um, Q&A box. Um, I have a few myself, but I think I'll let our attendees um, go ahead. So I'll be calling on um, uh, individuals and I'll actually, I should be, so Khaled, um, you should be able to talk now um, and ask your question that you had typed in the box if you want to. Hmm, maybe. Do you have to I, unmute? I had, I think, oh, unmute him. Oh, ask to unmute. Yeah, I guess I allowed him to talk, but I have to, maybe now you can accept it. Try, try asking. Maybe that doesn't work. <laughs> oh, um, Gina, uh, can you help with the tech technology there, or do you think um, I don't know? Maybe yeah. I should. Yeah, Khaled, are you questions. still are you still there, Khaled? Maybe I guess he, I can um, also read his his question, and then for the next ones, I'll I'll try that again, and if not, I'll read a few more. So he asked um, if you checked um, if influenza infection before rhinovirus infection uh, had a similar effect, or what the outcome of that was. Um, I I think I have to say I think that the person doing this project has done it, but I can't remember. And I think there was, but I can't remember. But I can. That was recent if it was done, but I can tell you that has been pub that the, another group recently published that, that um, they, they used a different uh, organoid epithelial model and showed that, that uh, influenza or RSV blocked subsequent rhinovirus infection. So it's possible, the clinical data doesn't give you a directionality. It just tells you there's lower co-detections than expected. The reason we did it in the order we did it is because that's the order that it happens every year. Mm -hmm. in terms of the pandemics and that's what was observed in 2009 but i mean my prediction would be and I, we went into this in our discussion of that of that study was would be you just if you look at those kinetic curves of host response you could predict like for example influenza we don't see much interferon response by 24 hour but you do by 72 
So if you if you tried your second infection at 72 hour, you you would expect interferon mediated interference. But if you tried it at 24 hours, you wouldn't. So that that's what I would predict. But the extent to which those have been tested, um, that not very much. Just because it takes so long to grow these cultures, you can't do every condition you want right at the beginning. Uh, thanks. So then for the next one, we uh, unmuted Antoine. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, cool. Uh, so a uh, really nice talk. It was, it, I'm, I'm not uh, at all into, I'm, I'm a cancer biologist, but, but it was really, really interesting. I learned a lot. Um, so I guess I will reframe a bit my question, because uh, you talked about mm -hmm. it at the end of your talk, about uh, trying to assess what are the factors that are uh, leading eventually to the failure of the epithelium to prevent virus propagation. So what do you think is the most important? Is it like the, the general uh, ecological context around the epithelium with all you talked about, viruses, bacteria, microbiome, all of that? Or do you think like there is host specific factors that could also be involved as biomarkers to predict uh, risk, like the efficacy of the epithelium to prevent virus propagation? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, you can think of, you could almost make a list and we've almost tried to like, think if you were gonna model this mathematically, what's the minimum number of factors that you would have to account for? And of course, one of the really important things for most viruses is the barrier defense. And part of that barrier defense is actually secreted IgA. So, the, so for most viruses, probably the extent to which the virus even gets past the defense and gets into the epithelium has to do with that barrier, which is partly mediated by by a prior B cell response. Now in the case of a pandemic virus like SARS-CoV-2 or in the case of young, young children, you don't have that factor okay. as much, you know? So, that, so that's like first, you just think of the different layers, then you're getting into the cell. Viruses differ in how, how sensitive they are to, um, to various host defense pathways, depending on how well they inhibit the pathways that block them. And viruses really vary to, to a great degree in how sensitive they are. To these responses so that so yeah so i think that it's it's uh really i, I mean i know that if i, if I had the, the the simplest parameters you could come up with are how much input is there into the system how much virus gets in the cell mm. what are the replications uh kinetics of the virus and what are the replications kinetics of the host defense response but there's many molecular mechanisms that feed into that and so that's not that are not unpacked <laughs> yeah. yeah okay thank you Um, we were trying to um, see if maybe Daniel Asarnoff would like to ask his next question live. Um, you should be able to talk if you want to. I guess maybe the um, letting people ask live doesn't work so well. Maybe I should just uh, continue reading. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. I, was just, I was just wondering if... Uh, there had been any experiments to exclude some aspect of cellular resource exhaustion impacting the second infection. Yeah, I mean that that was one of the so that's one of the theories, right? Like that so there have been different ideas what causes viral interference over the course of the past 50 years. People have been thinking about it and that's one idea. The the, the virus uses all the resources so there's no resources for the second virus to replicate. But that's not the case at least for rhinovirus and flu. Because when we block the innate immune response, both viruses are higher. So if, if it was that, you know, you would expect if, if one virus was using all the resources and that was preventing the other, you would have to block that first virus to let the second virus go up. But for these two viruses in our experiment, that's not the case. Whether that's sometimes the case, that could be, you know, but not in the case of, of these two viruses. Thanks. Um, maybe we can do one um, last question. I'll just read it out um, right away. So um, Jody was wor uh, wondering if um, you have tried sequential infection with any other respiratory viruses apart from um, the flu. Uh, we are. We're sort of, sort of in the process of doing that. I mean, we're, we don't have a really conclusive, solid data. You know, with these human donors, you have to repeat things with different donors because there's some human-to-human -human variation as well. Uh, 
But one thing we were interested in is different rhinovirus strains. So that's one thing we've been looking at. Of course, we're interested in COVID-19. So we've been looking at that as well. And hopefully we'll have some more. I don't want to say something that's not going to turn out to be true. So I, but I think we're, we're getting close to having some more data on different combinations soon. Yeah, super interesting. Um, I was thinking that we'll be sending you the list of questions that came up in the Q&A and then maybe um, we could even like put a, together uh, some answers to that um, if you want to. And we can, sure, yeah, I think a few people will also be in, uh, in, a, in the lunch um, meeting with you after. So maybe some people can also ask their questions there. But I think um, this, like there being so many questions more that we can answer in the question and answer just shows that it was a great uh, talk that you gave there. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you um, for all your great questions. I see these interesting questions rolling by in the chat. So <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll send you the list for sure so that you uh, know. And uh, thank you again, everybody for attending and thank you, um, Ellen, for giving that interesting talk. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.